Hi, everyone. Uh, like uh, Jill introduced, I'm the director of the uh, Cancer Center Flow Core for, we we'll call it the Flow Saturnator Resource Facility. And uh, so, uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm happy to have uh, Dr. Joe Crespo. He is the technical application specialist from uh, uh, SciTech to give us kind of an overview about uh, that uh, the uh, the SciTech Arola, uh, the uh, uh, spectral flow cytometry. You can do it uh, with this machine. You can do a full spectrum profiling on uh, uh, you know. We, well, before actually it goes to that, I want to give some kind of introduction. It's a different introduction. We want to get attention from the potential users that we have actually uh, in our core installed the SciTech Arola, which is a, a, a four laser machine, has a 48 fluorescent channel plus uh, three scatter channels. And you can stuff, let's say up to 30 colors into a single panel. And uh, some of you might uh, know that uh, in our core, we have a uh, site top before, but uh, because of the, the uh, cost to use that uh, machine, it's, it's being decommissioned. And so now we have this uh, uh, site tech roller. Like I said that you can put uh, uh, up to 30 colors into a single panel. It should be enough to, uh, uh, for majority of the task to do a deep, uh, uh, immunophenotyping or some other uh, uh, uses. And uh, so uh, the advantage for this is that uh, probably Joe will also tell us that it uses regular fluorescent dye conjugate, conjugate antibody. So you don't have to get like the site top, uh, the uh, heavy metal conjugated dye, which costs much more. And uh, this machine actually also can resolve highly overlapping dyes, which gives some advantage that uh, you don't have to design a complex, complex panel for like a 20, 30 colors to thinking about using the Arola. Sometimes that when you do an experiment, although it's only have five, six colors, but you suddenly realize that, yes, I want to get uh, add another uh, antibody or two. However, that uh, if you look at the, your fridge, that you found that I have used the PSI5, and the antibody I want to add is PSI5.5 or PSI7 level. And uh, well, in regular flow machine, it's difficult to accommodate both PSI5, a PSI5 or PSI5.5 because the the uh, 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 spectrum is, you know, heavily overlapped, but with this uh, Cytec Arola, yes, you can just uh, add that antibody. But the other example is that, well, there are other examples too, like uh, APC versus uh, Alexa Floor 647. And again, that is difficult to run uh, together on a regular uh, flow machine. All that GFP, YFP, if you have, uh, like I actually have trouble to uh, to do linear tracing for the development of uh, of uh, um, regulatory T cell that was labeled with uh, GFP and YFP. It's difficult to resolve on regular uh, uh, flow machine, but it's easy to uh, to do on uh, the SciTech Arola. So in other words, that you don't have to design like a 20 uh, antibody panels to thinking about that use the the uh, Arola, just that if you doing things like a GFP, YFP together, or that you have antibodies, you have to have, uh, have to use like a PSI5, PSI5.5, or APC versus uh, Alexa Flow 647, just to use uh, the, the uh, uh, a roller, it, it, it can easily be done. The other thing I want to say is that uh, the, the it charges for this for using SciTech roller 
it will charge it as a regular uh, uh, flow machine so that it's you don't have to pay extra money to to use the static raw again that uh, use it as a regular uh, 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 flow machine and don't think about that it will only think about it when you want to uh, stuff like it like I said a 20 30 uh, uh, antibodies into a panel the other thing is that uh, it can be accessed, obviously, it's for the for the local users uh, uh, on campus. That you, have, if you have uh, after our access to the to the flow core, then you can use uh, this machine after hour. And uh, sometimes it's important if you have a clinical sample that uh, uh, received uh, after five o'clock or four p.m. You either have to. Uh, wait until the next day you can use the cytic uh, uh, a roller that uh, uh, processed after nine o'clock at uh, 9 p.m so with that i will hand the podium to uh, to dr crespo so he will give um, more detailed introduction to the to the to the system perfect uh thank you for that kind introduction uh dr joe um so Yes, so today the title of the talk that I'll be giving to you today is full spectrum profiling. So that is basically the approach that we take whenever we are presenting, uh, or sorry, uh, the way that we uh, approach uh, flow cytometry. At its core, it's still going to be uh, flow cytometry. The change that we have in our, in our system is just the way that we collect light. And so I'll explain that a little bit uh, today. Um, in terms of today's agenda, um, I'll talk about SciTech, uh, the um, as a company, I'll talk about full spectrum profiling. I'll give a little bit of a tour in terms of the hardware and the software on the SciTech instruments, and then several applications that have been uh, ongoing in in our system as well. Um, just a just, just a, a brief snapshot here to start. Um, we have placed over a thousand units worldwide. Um, this includes universities and hospitals. Uh, we have um, units in pharma companies, biotech companies, and across the world in 25 countries. Uh, the company is 500, is over by 500 employees, um, and it's still growing. We still get quite a few emails in terms of those people that continue joining. Uh, and we have a worldwide applications service and sales team. Uh, our offices, uh, for example, we have a, uh, our headquarters at Fremont, California. We have offices in Bethesda. San Diego, Seattle, as well as in Shanghai, China, uh, Netherlands, and in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we most recently, last year, uh, acquired Tumbo Biosciences. So we are expanding our um, portfolio of reagents. Uh, so check those out. There's quite a few of those that are spectrically unique, uh, which means that you can, those are called high parameter enablers. So if you're going for higher uh, panels or you know bigger uh, panels in your in your experiments, then those would uh, allow you to expand on bigger panels so that colors that before would overlap very carefully now you can actually separate between them uh, a little bit easier. Um, so if you have questions about those reagents, uh, please reach out to me, um, and I'll put you in contact with our reagents team as well. Um, but just a little bit of a, our product history here. So SciTech itself was founded in July 2015. That was a merger of two different companies. Um, and then at that, uh, two years later, we came out with the SciTech Aurora, so the five laser instrument. Uh, two years later, we came out with the Northern Lights. This goes all the way to three lasers at the same time. Um, but really in the SciTech Aurora uh, with the five laser instrument on January of 2020, that is when we actually published our OMIP69, uh, which showed our ability to differentiate between a 40 color uh, panel in, um, in humans. So what we did was we took uh, human peripheral blood uh, cells and we actually were able to characterize uh, the major cell subsets in human, uh, in, in human blood um, using this panel. And we'll talk about this uh, later on today as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are coming out with our own reagents. Uh, we have uh, seafloors, so that's, that's what we uh, call our specific uh, vials or our own uh, reagents there. And we're also coming out with our own kits, uh, which I will talk about later on as well. These are great because you can use them as a backbone and then just switch out whatever you might not be interested in. And, uh, but you know already that these antibodies work 
and you can uh, at least start off with that backbone um, for many for many experiments. It's, it's and it's pretty much plug and play uh, for for quite a few different applications out there. I've, I've had great feedback from our customers in terms of that. And we just recently launched uh, the SciTech Aurora CS. So this is our cell sorter and um, it's also available. So if that is something that is also interested in, uh, for you, uh, you can always reach out to our sales team. Uh, this, um, the idea behind the CS is that whatever you were already running in your SciTech instrument, then you should be able to run it in the Aurora and uh, um, separate that or sort it yourselves out. All right. And so we are a customer centric organization. Uh, we do provide theoretical and hands on training uh, with every acquisition of the instrument. You already have one. Um, but if you were interested, if anybody was interested um, in obtaining sort of that training as well, that formalized training, you can reach out to us. Uh, we can always provide that for you. Um, that we also provide ongoing TAS support. This is actually a pretty old uh, picture. It's like three years ago before the pandemic hit. So this team, the TAS team has doubled in size since then. Um, so pretty, pretty big in that sense. Um, we do have an Aurora user community. And so if you're not part of it, uh, please let me know. We can always send you a link for that. Basically with this uh, community, you can ask your own questions. Uh, and uh, it's user led. So if there are any questions in terms of, you know, how to apply your experiments or anything like that, you can, um, you can ask that there. It's also moderated by us in the, by, by us TASs as well. And there's tons of resources online. Uh, we have blogs, we've got videos, we've got our spectrum viewer. Uh, so check them out on our websites. You are not alone when you're starting up your experiment. There's wealth of resources. And if you have if there's there any questions that we should be answering, then we would always um, make sure to um, add those resources as well as a white paper or something like that as well. And as I mentioned, uh, we do offer panel design and custom conjugation services. Um, this is one uh, of our kits, the 25 color kit, um, which would be compatible with your system. Um, and so again, I will talk to you about that uh, more later on. Uh, we just most recently came out with uh, SpectroLearn. And this is our, in our website as well, it's an education center. And pretty much what it does is that it has uh, six different uh, videos that talk about panel design best practices. Um, and all of this can be applied to your uh, existing, you know, older uh, cytometers as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the way, you know, the, um, the only difference between our cytometer and the other ones is the way that we collect light. Um, but everything else is, is, is the same. So let's talk about full spectrum profiling. <clears throat> so at first, so this is how in, in, in an older instrument, in a conventional cytometer looks at a color. So you have your specific dye that gets excited by your main excitation laser. That dye then gets excited and emits um, that light that is then captured by a specific band pass filter. And so only that light is then collected inside that square. And what we found is that really what you're seeing is that that's just a the tip of the iceberg when you're analyzing um, your, your specific dyes. Uh, you're still ignoring so much information coming out of that uh, light emission. And so what we do instead is that we start collecting that light as well. And so the way that we do that is here. So this is how FITC would look in a conventional cytometer. Uh, after the light, after the dye is excited, you have the bandpass filter one, and that is the signal that is utilized for FITC. Then you've got your bandpass filter two, and for example, that could be PE, for example, and that light is then compensated out of that bandpass filter. And that's how um, that, that signal is, is, is used in an older instrument. Whereas all the light that is in between those bandpass filters or falls outside of those is completely ignored FITC signal. So the way that we've approached this instead is that we've actually sliced the light uh, further down and added much more detectors. And so instead we can see here, and this is just for the blue uh, laser, we have here now 14 detectors that are collecting light just from the blue laser excitation. And so all of that light is then captured and that is how we capture that signature for each of the colors that pass through the um, the system or our, our APDs, our detectors. You still have some light that is ignored, but that is because that is where the lasers are passing through. And so if you were to just collect that light, that's just going to be garbage. 
uh, so we don't characterize that. And so we do have, uh, you know, in, in our in, in your case, you have up to four lasers. So you've got the yellow, green, blue, red, and violet lasers. These are all spatially separated, which means is that when your sample is passing through the flow cell, each laser is going to excite your dye separately, and the dye, the, sorry, the the light that is emitted from each specific uh, laser is then captured by their own dedicated uh, detector modules. These are avalanche photodiodes. Um, and so that is how we then capture all that signature from each of the different lasers that you have in your instrument. Two notes here to know, uh, that I'd like to point out is that the instrument has two side scatter detectors, the blue and the violet. Um, the violet offers better resolution for smaller particles. And so in fact, this is the one that we use uh, for the most part. We don't usually use the blue since the violet um, gives us that much better resolution for our, our, our scatter uh, profiles. So here's something for you to, to know if you're not familiar with that, then you know if you start when you start using the machine, um, just know that you have that there. But in terms of avalanche photodiodes, so as they compare to PMTs, which is what older instruments use, uh, avalanche photodiodes are very small light detectors. Um, and so that's why you can see that the cytometer itself is actually pretty small compared to other instruments. Um, these uh, avalanche photodiodes are the size of a pencil eraser, and they offer high quantum efficiency in the red region, as well as high sensitivity for the far red dyes. And so in terms of what quantum efficiency is, uh, quantum efficiency is the uh, ability to uh, change from uh, photons that are captured by the detectors into electrons and signal that is then used in, by your computers um, you know, to obtain the data. And so here you can see that a PMT at its highest is about 20% capable of transforming all the photons that, is that are collected um, to uh, electrons. Whereas you can see here that for APD modules, this is what we use in our system, at its height is very close to 90%, 100% uh, almost. Um, and so you can see that at its lowest, it's still pretty higher than um, the PMTs. So by doing this, we're able to then get a better, much more better uh, sensitivity for the and, and resolution for the dyes that we are running in our system. Um, and so this is then how your signature would look. Um, in your case, you do not have the UV detector, so you don't have this on the, on the far left side, but everything else you would have. So you have 16 detectors out of the UV, uh, the, um, the violet, 14 out of the blue, 10 out of the yellow green, and eight out of the uh, red uh, laser. And this is just how one die would appear in your case. Um, and this, you can see that it's peaking on V14. Um, but it still has certain signatures that are, or certain signals that are coming out of the other laser because it is excited um, by the other lasers as well. Um, but let's talk about using overlapping dyes together now. So let's use that signature as an example. So here at the top, we have APC and Alexa Floor 647. And in an older instrument, a conventional instrument, you would only be able to use one of these two colors um, in your experiment. But in our case, because of the way that we collect light, we can actually separate between these two colors. And so here at the top is APC, and here at the bottom is Alexa Floor 647. What you'll notice is that APC peaks on red one, and Alexa Floor 647 peaks on red two. Aside from that, you also start seeing differences in the yellow green, in the blue, in the violet, as well as the UV lasers. And it's not highlighted here, but yeah. So you can see that when you compare APC and Alexa 4647, there are those uh, specific differences there. By capturing that light and capturing that spectrum instead of just the peak where they, um, they're coming from, we can then use these two colors in tandem um, in the same uh, experiment. So here I have an example where we have CD3 fit C uh, on the x-axis to separate between non-T cells and T cells. And then we separate between CD8 APC and CD56 Alexa Floor 647. And you can see how we can actually separate and obtain all four different populations, the single positives, the double positive, and the double negative uh, for each of the different um, uh, populations here. 
Um, and that is only because of the way that we are able to collect light um, in, in, in our flow cytometers. Um, we do have quite a few, uh, you know, that because of that, because of the way that we collect light, we have quite a few different flexibilities uh, when using our fluorochromes and using fluorochromes that are out there. Um, we have identified and characterized quite a few of the different um, colors that are out there. And if, you know, if some new one comes out, you can let us know, we'll characterize it and make sure to have that information as well too, so we can add it to our, to our guides. But things that are pretty important here is the ones that have an asterisk, like this one, these, this one here, and 781. These are unique, uh, spectrically unique. What that means is that there's nothing else that is that shares that signature uh, compared to anything that's out there in the um, in the market, and so these are great because that that's, that's what I call or what we call high parameter enablers. Um, that will that, you know you don't lose a detector. You can actually put that together with another color that might peak on the same detector, and um, you can separate between those two because of their own unique spectrum that they are showing. And that you can only do uh, because of spectral of the spectral technology. Um, and now, you know, when you're starting this off, you might be um, nervous or something like that when you're starting off your first ex uh, experiment on this. Um, but you're not alone. There's quite a few different tools um, that are out there for you to be successful in our machine. For example, we have the fluorochrome selection guidelines, and so here it's all online. Uh, and there's unique ones for each configuration. So you would choose your four laser configuration. And in here, it has the signatures for quite a few of the different dyes that are out there. And this is continuously being updated. So we're coming out with the next iteration in a few uh, months, I believe. So watch, you know, watch out for that. This also has quite a few different information in terms of uh, stain indices, uh, which we use whenever we are um, preparing our panel, as well as the cross stain index um, for how different colors interact with each other. We also have our spectrum viewer, and this is great because you can then compare how similar two colors might be to each other at a very high level. This offers you the ability to, to, to see how the normalized signatures between two colors um, are, like whether they're similar or not, but you can further quantify that. So we also have our similarity and complexity indices here. And so let me talk a little bit about that further. So let's take the example from before. We have here Alexa Floor 647 in violet, and we have APC in red here. And you can see that these two colors are quite similar. Again, you can see that the APC peaks on red one, violet peaks on R2, but then across the spectrum, they are dissimilar. Like they're not, they're not the same color, right? Um, so we further quantify that. Uh, by looking at, so we go through a scale of zero, which means that there's completely no overlap between the two colors, and one, which means that these two colors are the exact same color, the same signature. So our limit is 0 0.98. If the colors are 0 0.98 similar, that is the exact limit that we go for. Anything, we can go 0 0.98 and below to differentiate. Um, that being said, you know, you have 48 detectors in your system. Um, unless you're going, unless you're pushing up to 30 colors, um, I would advise you not to push that just because it's going to make your life a little bit more difficult uh, whenever you're unmixing and whenever you are um, separating between the, the, the colors that you are looking at. Um, but here, for example, you have APC and Alexa Floor 647 with a similarity of 0 0.9. And as you saw before, we can separate between those two colors. Um, in, in our system here as well. In terms of complexity, you can see that there, and that's just like a very high overview. If, if you notice that your experiment differs from um, the one that's listed online, then you can start checking out where that those changes are when you look at the similarity indices. And this is just showing you yeah, the, the explanation of those two colors um, and those two indices here. <clears throat> And this is all available in both our SpectraFlow software as well as our website. Um, another thing is that because of the way that we collect light, we can also then distinguish or measure the autofluorescence of the cell types that we are running. So for example, here at the top, we've got red blood cells. 
which are really not that autofluorescent. You can see how they're pretty quiet across every detector here. Then you've got alveolar macrophages on the second row, and you can see how they're actually very autofluorescent, and this could lead to, to issues in another instrument if you weren't able to, to compensate that out properly. And then lymphocytes here, uh, which can be autofluorescent, um, and they're especially autofluorescent in the UV violet and a little bit in the blue lasers. And this is just normal autofluorescence from lymphocytes. So what we do is that we capture that light and we actually take that into consideration when we are, um, when we are unmixing. So here we have um, IPS cells that are transformed to express GFP. This is our gating here. At the top, we've got non-transformed cells. On the bottom, now we have GFP positive cells. And you can see how there's only that very little shift on B1 and B2. That's just the GFP that's being detected. Um, let's look at it sort of like after unmixing. So here you have the non-transformed uh, non cells. There's no GFP coming out. Then here you've got GFP positive cells, but there's no autofluorescence being extracted just yet. So I'm sure that if I were to give this uh, plot to all of you here, I would probably get as many gating strategies as there are people here right now, um, which is not great. Um, so instead, what we do is that we extract that autofluorescence. And now you can see how you have a very clear positive GFP signal and a very clear negative um, uh, population here. And if I were to give this plot to all of you here, I would get um, a nice clear box that encloses the GFP positive cells. So that's really the, the power of autofluorescence extraction. Um, so that's always you know, a great tool uh, for people that might be using lungs, for example, or liver tissues that can be highly autofluorescent. And so, as I mentioned, so there are quite a few benefits um, in terms of using that full spectrum approach. Um, the way that we capture light across multiple detectors really enables us to then have more flexibility in the different colors that we can run in our system and using highly overlapping dyes. Uh, we have higher resolution data, uh, so we can go all the way up to 40 colors in a single tube, um, and we can glean more information from one single tube. So for example, in your case, uh, you have a four laser system, you can get uh, up to 30 colors and you can push that further um, by using um, the higher, you know, the high parameter enabler um, antibodies that I've mentioned so far. And as well, the ability to extract autofluorescence um, also really ha will help you a lot in terms of um, separating between positives and negatives as well, or, or improving the resolution of, of different colors. Um, now, before I jump to the next uh, section, um, I'd be welcome, you know, I'd welcome any questions. I know that there's none so far in the chat, but um, if there are any questions I can ask, uh, you can ask them now before I move forward. So are you going to uh, mention about comp uh, compensation that's required and um, how many cells at a minimum you need to have in order to, to, to run, let's say 12 colors, 20 colors, for example? Okay. Um, so for that, you'll make sure that you'll bring in uh, your single color controls uh, so that you have, um, you, know, you, you have your specific signature. You want, importantly, uh, you want to make sure that in your single color controls, you're using the same antibody vial as your multicolor sample. And you treat your reference controls, we call them reference controls, um, the same way as your multicolor sample. That means any washes, any buffers, any incubation times, you want to treat your reference controls the same way as your multicolor to make sure that you have um, that you're treating the dyes. If any, if any changes that occur to the dye during treatment, then you're capturing that um, in your reference controls. Your reference controls can be beads or cells. That it, that is really up to you. You need to make sure that they are as bright or brighter than the multicolor sample. And that's the same as you would in a um, in an older in a conventional cytometer as well. There, um, mm -hmm. yeah, as usual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as per yeah. usual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just you know, just but just making sure. A lot of people don't know these uh, specific rules, but yeah. And so you want to make sure as well that um, you get a clear positive, you get a clear negative. Your negative does not have um, any background staining, so that the signatures can be extracted properly. So you know, tighter down your antibodies. And then in terms of how many 
cells or beads, you want to collect at least 200 to 500 events of the brightest cells. So however many or, you know, however many uh, events you need to collect so that you have 200 or 500 of the brightest population for each single reference control, that's what you'll need. So I can't tell you like an overarching one for lymphocytes, for example, because if you're looking at uh, IL-17 and human PBMCs, that might be pretty difficult uh, to obtain. So you might need to run tons of cells there, or you might need to use beads in that case. Um, so that's um, just, you know, so the, the, the way would be to 200 to 500 of the brightest um, events for each single reference control. Okay, uh, there is a question online. Does the spectral approach improve the resolution of rare cell populations? Also, does the spectral approach enhance quantification of heterogeneous populations with a range of marker expression? Um, I mean, so you will see improved resolution when you're looking, and this is just for any markers, really. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to see um, positives and negatives, you know, the positive cells uh, a lot better because of our APD detectors. Um, and because of autofluorescence extraction. So if you're having issues with autofluorescence, then that will improve uh, your, your, your data there. Um, so there is that aspect of it there too. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by quantification of heterogeneous populations with a range of marker expression. Um, you will be able to, you know, like CD45 array, uh, you've got like bright and then you've, you know, it can go down slowly. Um, so, I mean, it's the same thing. You'll still be able to see the, um that range as well there is that does that answer your question right yes so sometimes cell populations have mixed expression of markers yes um so long as you make it so long as you when you select your single color control you make sure that you gate on the brightest uh cells or, or beads so that you you know and that they are corresponding in terms of brightness to your multicolor sample then um, unmixing should be okay and so in that sense you'll you you'll be okay. Um, I think that the important thing here is how you approach your panel design. So when you're designing your panel, uh, take into consideration how bright or dim your die of choice is. What that means is that if you're looking at IL-17, for example, that is a tertiary antigen. That's a, a difficult antigen to detect. Um, give it its best chance by using something like PE. PE is one of the brightest, if not the brightest color out there. So choose that one for your tertiary antigens, for your difficult to detect um, antigens. Uh, choose uh, now for something that's easy to detect like CD3 or CD45 in human PBMCs, then choose something like uh, Pacific Orange that is super dim. You don't need to have that high, um, uh, high level of, uh, of stain index. So that is the way that you would approach your panel design. I think that that really goes down to how you design your panel and not necessarily the, the, the hardware on, on the instrument here, although the, the instrument um, is, is, you know, works well. Um, yeah, so in, and in terms of that, if you have questions about that, there is a stain index in our fluorochrome guide um, that tells you how bright each color is. Make sure that you choose the four laser configuration and there is a how each color interacts with each other. So also take that into consideration. Um, you can, if you have questions, you can reach out to me later on as well. Um, there is a second question: Can we use reagents from other companies? Of course, um, anything that has a uh, that that you know reacts to fluorescence. So if it's excited by any one of the lasers that you have in your in, your, in the system, if it's excited, it's usable. So it's what we call future proof or future compatible, any new colors that uh, come out and are excited by any of the four lasers here, we'll be able to uh, get, you know, get that signature and, um, and characterize it and use it. So what's being done now is that uh, SciTech, in a way, has forced other companies to go back and look at the uh, colors that they had previously seen. Oh, no, this peaks in the same spot as FITC. We cannot use it. But now they're going like, oh, wait. It peaked in FITC, but what if it's spectrically unique? And um, they're, you know, that's where the new colors are coming out from. All right. 
So let's move forward now. So let's go through the hardware and software and the instruments here. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here is a really quick peek inside. So here you can see at the top, you've got your optical bench with the cover removed. Here is where your five laser, your four lasers are housed, as well as your flow cell. Uh, you have your sample sit station. So this is where your, your, your sit line is going to come down onto the tube or plate to, uh, to be run um, um, for, from your sample. It has a vacuum fluidics module, so it's not using a pressurized system. And then you have, uh, like I said, the plate loader, uh, which in your case is the newer one. <clears throat> in terms of additional hardware features, so we do have a flow meter. Uh, which allows for volumetric counting. It also has a bubble clock detection system. So if you, you know, if you run your plate and it detects a bubble or it runs dry, it'll stop acquiring, it'll move to the next one. If it detects a clog, it'll stop acquiring, it'll move to the next one. Um, but of course, always make sure to filter, pre-filter your cells before putting them into any uh, flow cytometer. It's got low electronic noise, which then leads to higher resolution. Um, that is in part because our flat top laser beam design. So what that is, is that the time that each cell spends on interrogated uh, by each laser in the flow cell is a little bit longer. And so that allows for better alignment stability. And the resolution is then not as impacted as uh, changing flow rate as other instruments. Uh, we do have blue and violet side scatter detectors. The violet is much better at detecting small particles, but in general, it's just much better um, laser, so I highly recommend you use that one. Um, although, you know, certain applications do call for the blue detector. And one configuration works for all assays. So there's no need to change optical filters. All of the detectors are turned on at all times. All of the lasers are turned on at all times. So there's no need to optimize anything there. In terms of the software itself, it's, it is pretty user-friendly. I've gone to hands-on trainings and all of a sudden they're already you know, doing experiments, that sort of thing, because they were able to figure things out. Uh, when you start up an experiment, you want to create it by selecting which colors you want to run through our library. Uh, you want to then add what markers you're going to be running and how many tubes, as well as the worksheets that you want to add for that specific experiment. Um, after you've created your experiment, you will load and run your tubes. Um, initially, you'll get access to the raw data. After you run reference controls and unmix your data, uh, you will go through a wizard for this unmixing, which you will just select those brightest populations. So basically what you would do is that gate on the brightest events, as I mentioned before, and gate on the lower half of the negative population for each of the uh, reference controls that you are running. And then after you do that, you press live unmix here on the uh, bottom right corner. And then from there, you'll be able to have your unmixed data, which is the same way as you are most used to seeing data. So you'd have the on the x and y axes, the specific color and marker that you're running. And you can analyze that in any um, you're in your favorite software. So if you're using Flojo, Omic, FCS Express, um, you can use that. These are just going to be FCS files. Um, one thing here is that you do have a one year license agreement to FCS Express because you bought the instrument um, last year. So um, if you're not aware of that, then you can reach out to Dr. Joe um, for, for, for the use of that, um, that, that, that license too. Um, in terms of uh, the SpectraFlow software, so again, trying to talk about how it differs between conventional and full, and, uh, uh, full spectrum profiling. Um, in a way, I think that it's a lot easier to use our instrument than other instruments because in older instruments, you would have to confirm the panel that it can be run with the existing optical configuration. In our case, one configuration works for all assays uh, where you would need to optimize the voltage for each single color that you're running in the machine. In our case, we've called, we have something called pre-optimized SciTech assay settings, and these work for about 90% of all the experiments that are out there. Um, so it only changes if you're having something like Cherry, which can be super bright or uh, incorrectly titered um, antibodies. So these are, these are pretty great in that sense. Um, you do, you know, after that, you collect your unstained um, and compensation controls. In our case, you collect your unstained and the reference control. You would then calculate compensation in 
conventional. In our case, you would do unmixing, which is just a wizard. And then you would acquire the live unmixed data, uh, the multicolor data, which is the same as the compensated multicolor data. Um, in terms of software features, so I, um, again, the cytochastic settings are pretty great in that sense that you, know, you can just put your sample in. The only thing you need to change is the forward and side scatter to make sure that you're visualizing your cells properly. Um, and it does offer high resolution for the uh, multicolor sample that you might be running. Um, there's tools for you to better understand how each dye is unique and how they're similar or dissimilar they are to each other using the similarity mate, uh, index to look at through the um, each, you know, how each color interacts with each other and the complexity for the uh, panel that you are running. You can always quality check your reference controls by using that similarity index as well as by saving um, previously run uh, single color controls as benchmarks. And you can always make sure that when you're running new um, dies, then you're making sure new um, uh, reference controls that they are similar or not to that stored in the library. Um, and so you can always use uh, cytochastic settings for uh, standardization across the several instruments. Another thing here is that um, you can use the stored reference controls over time. And this is because of having the linear APD modules, um, which are always uh, up updated whenever you run your daily QC. And so um, in terms of applications that you can use on the Cytec Aurora, there are quite a few uh, applications being used right now. So there's over 300 uh, publications out there, including immunology, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory diseases, uh, immunotherapy as well. Um, so this is uh, this should be high, um, updated already too. Um, so we do, as I mentioned, we do have quite a few uh, kits that um, that we can uh, provide for you. Um, they've already been optimized in terms of panel design, as well as the titer that you need to use in your individual reagents. Um, and there's also a, a protocol that we give you. So we give you a recommended protocol for your preparation um, and we also have an importable experiment template that you can bring into your uh, instrument and use whenever you're running these kits. Um, you would just need to stain your samples, run the single color controls, confirm that everything is okay there, unmix and get your live unmixed data, get your multicolor sample there. And again, so the, the great thing about this is that you can use these as a backbone. You already know that these antibodies work, you know that these antibodies, the titer has already been given to you. So you can start off from this um, and then add more colors uh, as, need, as needed. Um, so highly recommend that you, um, that you, you guys, you know, everybody here check uh, these out uh, because they, you know, they're, they're actually pretty great. Um, and I've got, I've gotten great uh, support from, or not support, uh, feedback from people here. Um, that being said, so as I mentioned before, we did, we were able to publish a 40 color panel. Um, so the idea behind that was we've got these five lasers, we've got these, uh, 64 detectors. Um, let's see how far we can push this. And so we wanted to separate between the different human blood cells that are in blood. And so these are some of the markers that we decided to use in our 40 color panel. And so again, this was published already uh, as an OOP 69. Um, and we can see here that we were able to separate between higher or, or you know, abundant cells such as B cells, T cells, uh, but we were able to go down and further uh, characterize dendritic cells, NK cells, ILCs, as, far, as well as several subsets of CD4 and CD8 T cell subsets. Um, one important thing here that I always like to, um, to highlight in terms of the OOP 69 is not the you know, you know, 40 colors is great and everything, but not everybody's going to be doing that. Uh, the actual uh, gold, I'd say, or you know, the actual important thing about from this uh, paper is in the uh, supplementary material where it talks about how we optimized the panel and how we ran everything. So I highly, you know, whoever wants to build a panel and it's especially going to be a bigger panel, highly recommend that you go through that and check to see what we did. Um, this will be, you know, it, it'll, it'll 
be very good for you to see how it is that we approach this so that we can get reproducible um, results uh, with your with your experiments. Um, somebody asked whether we have optimized kits for analyzing mouse antigens. Uh, we are coming out with them. Um, I can put you in contact with our with a reagents team, and um, they'll be able to um, to get you. They might actually have something out already. Uh, it was coming out very soon. And so yeah, here is a little bit of that data where you show how we selected the titers for each of the different um, markers that we're interested in, and um, how again, if we looked, uh, if we were adding TCR gamma delta with the full cocktail, we were not able to separate between TCR gamma delta. Whereas if we added, we did it a sequential staining, we added TCR gamma delta earlier, then we can see how that separation is much better. So again, that's where the real um, important thing from that panel uh, or that uh, publication comes out. And so these are all going to be FCS files. So you can take these FCS files and analyze them in your favorite software. So here we have uh, TS and E analysis that we did for um, for these um, for, for this panel, uh, where we then able to separate between um, each each population here noted in the uh, on the bottom. And so um, just a so summary. Um, so in terms of full spectrum profiling. Um, high resolution data, you know, that's enabled through the low noise electronics and the high sensitivity of APD light detectors. Um, the way that we collect light, that's what allows us to have that spectral signature. It allows us to multiplex multiple, multiple um, colors, up to 40 colors in a five laser, five laser instrument, um, 30, 30 in a four laser. But again, you can, you can further push that by using high parameter enabler reagents. And uh, we have uh, you know, the ability to evaluate and extract autofluorescence really allows us to uh, have even better resolution uh, when we're pushing uh, when we're pushing the, the machine in, in highly autofluorescent cells or samples. Um, so if you have any questions, I would be more than happy uh, to answer them. You should also, if you have any questions, you can always as well email me so you can capture that uh, as a screenshot if you like and um, save that email. Um, but yeah, so if there's any questions, I'd happy I'd be happy to take them now. Is the software um, available um, for individual download, or it has to be used within the core facility? You can you can buy. So the software itself is free, but we have a, a dongle that you need to purchase from us so that you can uh, unlock it, if you will, from each computer. So. Uh, the dongle itself costs five hundred dollars, and it's just five hundred dollars. You don't need to. Um, you, there's no like yearly subscription or anything like that, so you you can do that. But for example, a lot of labs, what they do is that they have the one dongle, and they share it between uh, people that might be using SpectraFlow in their computer or just keep it in the analysis machine uh, for each lab. Um, but yeah. Uh, if there's any interest in that, you can let me know as well, and I can put you in contact with our sales team. Um, hi, I have a question. So mm -hmm. when you run the experiment, after mm -hmm. you calculated the uh, composition, after finishing the single color positive, so does that mean the composition had been completely finished? When you, uh, after that, when you run the sample, uh, it had been com compensated already? Yeah. So, so after that, if you take uh, the saved FCS file uh, to analyze it uh, with a uh, spectral flow, how can we make the composition better or that's the best that we have already? Okay. Yeah. So once you unmix the data, you will have the unmixed data or the unmixed FCS files. That's what you would call the compensated uh, mm -hmm. data. Um, that being said, so uh, ideally, you after you unmix, um, ideally, that already unmixes everything, and there's no issues with your with your data. Um, if there are any issues, um, we would make sure if, that we go back to your uh, unmixing wizard, and for example, make sure that you are gating on the brightest cells. Make sure that everything is on scale. Make sure that there's no background staining in your negative population. So those are the you know those are things that you would first do to troubleshoot your data, uh, because ideally everything is just unmixed, and that's it. 
However, if you did all of it and everything was perfect, um, you know, your, your reference controls, you treated your reference controls the same way as your multicolor sample, they're as mm -hmm. bright, you know, all, all of that, um, and there's still some errors, then you might need to do, you might need to adjust the spillover. And in SpectroFlow, you can do that. Um, so you can just change it uh, directly there. Uh, mm -hmm. Very easy. The only thing is that uh, we want to keep, because we've already unmixed the data, you want to make sure that the any corrections that you do, uh, you still adhere to a specific um, guideline. So for example, you would not go above 5%. Anything above 5%, you should just rerun your reference control because there's something wrong there. Um, mm -hmm. Ideally, what you would do is if it's 2% or lower, that's completely acceptable. Mm -hmm. Between 2 and 5, try to go back to the unmixing. Check to see what went wrong. Consider maybe rerunning that reference control. But if it's up to 5, then that's fine. Uh, anything above 5, then that's where the issues come. And that's, you know, that's not within the best practices that we recommend. Mm. So basically, the single positive control is uh, less forgivable. <laughs> so you have to have a really right single positive control. Mm -hmm. And after you uh, collect the data, it's probably not so useful if you analyze it with the flow do, try to adjust the composition further. I, yeah, well, I mean, you can do it in Flojo. You can do it in FCS Express. Uh, we recommend that you do it all on SpectraFlow. Um, and then from SpectraFlow, just take the unmixed data and analyze it um, in your favorite software. Okay. So anything unmixing, spillover corrections, all of that should be carried out on SpectraFlow. OK, thank you. Sure. So I, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, I, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. OK. So uh, uh, for example, you have run a bunch of uh, uh, single color control. And then, like uh, uh, Dr. Zhang mentioned, that if there are some issues, and you go back, I found that maybe one of the uh, reference control, the single color have some problems. So you redo that uh, single tube, the, the mm -hmm. single color control, mm -hmm. run it again. Can we actually using that to re-unmixing yep. the whole sample? Yep. OK. Yep, you can. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chris uh, Crespo, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, well, I guess um, with no further question, we'll end uh, here. Sounds good. Yeah. So if there's any questions, please, uh, later on, you can always email me. Um, if there's any panel design questions or anything like that, um, when you're setting up your first experiment, reach out to me um, and we can work with you. Great. Thanks so much, Joel. Awesome. Have a good one. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.